levels that you're going to that you can select. But as you're sitting here tonight, and when you I've left uh, the overheads with uh, some, but the idea is start thinking of where you think you're going to fit. Are you going to fit here? Almost 75 to 80 percent of you will choose right here. Nothing wrong with that. But that leaves this person with 5 percent. Leaves this person with 5 percent. Where are the people that are going to come up with the new ideas? I have a a question for the PhD students on their written exams. And what I do is I give them a blank piece of paper and I say, write down the 25 most influential people in my field. International, global, uh, strategy, human resources, stuff like that. Write them down. And they'll kind of get maybe 10 or 15 of them. I say, okay, that's fine. What do all of those people have in common? Every one of them. Every one of them is my age. Everyone is between 60 and 65 years old who say, where the hell is this field going to go? Then I do the exact same thing with them. I take that paper away and I turn another paper over to them and I say, now list the people that are going to take their places. And you can't do it. And the reason you can't do it is because people don't distinguish themselves here. They try to do it here and over time, this is what I call the grain of sand theory that I gave you last time. You're all on the beach at Gold Coast, and you're going to be a researcher, and here's your piece of sand, and you're going to put it on the beach. And you say, oh, look what I did. You look down the thing, and it's, everybody's done that. What you need to do is you need to come up with somebody that has artificial sand or whatever it may be that, to make it new and different and exciting and in a way to solve business problems. So for Shelby to say this is very, very important. Again, I've known him for 40 years, and he is a dyed the wool academic, you know, do it the right way, follow all the procedures, but for him to say, you need somebody to go, wait a minute, why are we doing this? Or, look what I found, couldn't we do something with this? Okay? And this is his Eureka model, as he calls it himself, where he says, here's how you're going to be trained to do research. Here are the steps that you're going to go through, but you better find somebody that can say to you, here's a new idea, let's study it. Okay? One of my goals with my PhD students is to make sure every one of them walks away with a new idea, something that's different. Okay, her predecessor was working on, with me on impatriation, okay, that's my topic. I, I think the topic will work with hers on the liability of foreignness. By being foreign, being different, how foreign can I accept back into my organization and still work with you, still absorb you as being a part of my organization? I think that's a really interesting new topic. Brand new, no, but it, the way we're going to position it, I think we'll make it really do. All, all we're saying here is, you're going to be taught to do this. If you really want to be this person over here that develops new knowledge, you better learn some of this. And it doesn't mean you're a genius, it just means you've got insight. I call it intuition. Okay? It's people that can look at things and see something no one else sees. You all look at the same data and you say, wait a minute, there's some data missing here. If we had this piece of information, it would help us do that. That's insightful. Okay? Okay? Here's some things that are taking place in the research environment. Here's some things that I think you need to be aware of that are going to impact you as a researcher. I don't care whether your field is marketing, management, engineering, it makes no difference. These things are happening. The first thing that happened is when you send out an article, the review process is being extended dramatically. And you say, well, so what? Well, that means rather than having an article that you write and it's accepted in three to six months, you have an article you write that's sent back to you for revision after a year. You send it back to them after three months and then it's, revi and it's reviewed for another nine months. You're taking the length of time that it takes to get one article out up to two years just like that. So your career is going to be based upon the timeline that other people are establishing for you. How do you do what Miriam's doing? We've got multiple projects at different stages of being produced. You have to think that way. The, the time of being a linear researcher, I'm going to start this project, I'm going to end this project, and I'm going to come up with a new project. You cannot do that anymore. This system will not allow you to do that. You won't be acceptable in your profession. Because at Bond, I know they have, they're shooting for two articles a year. Can they do that? The answer is yeah, but you better have 10 articles out there being reviewed because the acceptance rate at most better journals is going to be somewhere between 15 to 5 percent. So you say, well, okay, I've got 10 or 15 articles out there and that will give me two at the end of the year. 
it's really going to be hard to get at the end of the year when the review process is over a year long. You're going to say, well, look at all these things I've got under review, and they're going to go, we don't care. What have you done for us lately? The next thing that's coming out is the revisions are just crazy. I got a paper back, not, not the one you saw, Mary, but one with David Griffith. The comments by the reviewers were longer than the paper. <laughs> one of them said, do this. One of them said, do this. And the editor was in the middle saying, do both of those. It was the old adage, which we use in the States, we started out with a horse and we ended up with a camel. You know, I don't recognize what it, what it is that we're writing. I get papers back after to, to do the final, they're called galley proofs, going through and looking, which I normally have here in the gives them better. And I start reading the article and I go, I didn't write this. Miriam didn't write this. This is something that some ghost reviewers out there actually wrote for me. And you've got to learn how to deal with that. I think this is a major, major problem. One of the first things that's going to bother you, and think about going down to the casinos and saying, well, I'm going to go gambling tonight, and I've got probably a 15% chance of winning any money. And if I win some money, they're going to pay me some money I don't want. It's not going to be Australian dollars. It's going to be Taiwanese, I mean, uh, in Thailand, the bot or something like that. And that's what we're doing here. You're actually taking longer to get the reviews done. And when the reviews are integrated and accepted, you look at the paper and you say, it's not what I said. It's like having an argument with your wife. You say one thing and she hears something totally different. It has absolutely nothing to do with what you said. And these two are not, these are my day wives. I have a night wife and these are the day wives. They're the same way. Another thing that's going on is that the reviewers have been taught to be cannibalistic. Don't go into, this is the way they're trained, don't go into an article and say, well, how can I improve this? Go in and rip it up. I have, I'm an editor of a journal. I have a, a reviewer on my editorial view board. And I know David, and I hired David in his first job. He has never accepted a paper in 14 years. <laughs> <laughs> He's never accepted one. He's never even gotten close to accepting a paper. Now, why do I keep him on the review board? Yeah. Why do I keep him on there? He does beautiful reviews. I mean, they are just elaborate. And what I have to go through there is kind of pick out and tell the, the authors, just do these things. Don't do them all. The reviewers, though, have been taught to be like David, to go for the throat. And David's rationale for that is what? Well, there's only so many pages in that journal every year, and if I get this article, accept this article, then it keeps one of mine out of getting those pages. Now, he's warped, I understand that, but there are a lot of people out there like that that say, my job is to keep you out so I can get in. Or I don't like the topic you're working on and I want to keep it out. There's a topic that David doesn't like called Born Global. Companies that start out the first day and there are people that are arguing that they're global organizations and David doesn't think that's true. Anytime he gets something on, on, on Born Global, it's, it's terrible, it's no good, it's whatever. I find too many reviewers now and I, I review probably 300 articles a year. I find too many people not being constructed. What they want to do is say, you're foolish. You don't know what you're talking about. You haven't read this article. Rather than saying, hey, did you ever think about looking at this? You could add this theory into here. And that's what a reviewer, when I grew up, was supposed to do. Now let's go for the throat and show how stupid the person is. The outcome of that is what? Very insidious outcome of that. What is it? Less papers. Pardon me? Less papers being published. Less papers being published, although there's more journals. So there, there might be a wash there. What's happening, though? Publication reflects the reviewer's idea. The reviewer's idea of who you never know who they are. They're ghosts in the night making these, these decisions. But the biggest thing is, how long are you going to sit in that job that you're hoping to get out there doing research and you get rejected legally 80 to 90 percent of the time, and then you start reading these reviews and you say, these people don't know what the hell they're talking about. This is stupid. They didn't read the article. I can review any article you have and never read it. I can put down five or six things that are kind of generic to any article, and I can get the editor to look at it and say, oh, we better reject it. And don't think people don't do that. They do it. So we've got a real problem with the nature and the role of the reviewer has changed from being your kind of co-author, helping me to understand and read this article and bring this data in, to being, I don't want you to publish it here because then I can't publish it. And it's stupid.